Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, a, a really good uh, selection of papers there. I, I, I'm I just am waiting until we've got the panel up on the screen and then we'll go ahead with questions. Are they ready? Well, let me go ahead and ask a question. And in fact, um, it's from Harry Raffle and it's um, one that I wanted to ask as well because having worked with um, Buzz Mosley and Glenn Torpy myself in 2003 and four, their relationship was critical to things like delivering the early uh, unmanned uh, air vehicles to sort of British capability. So for Bill, um, from Harry, how important do you believe the personal relationship of RAF officers with American counterparts, particularly TEDA and senior USAF officers, was in defining the future direction of the RAF USAF relationship? Oh, completely important. Uh, and uh, these guys worked together during several parts of the, the combined bomber offensives, uh, the Mediterranean uh, Air Force and so on and so forth. So they, they, there's a strong legacy and a strong connection that goes through. But they were always quite pragmatic. They had their own ways of looking at things. Uh, and it wasn't always peace and light. Uh, there were some difficulties, just like any good relationship, right the way through. But largely speaking, it was a very, very constructive relationship. And, and one of the special things that I think comes out of all of this is how much the Royal Air Force and the USAF got on uh, as distinct from the sister services. Um, and uh, uh, several uh, of the authors have written about the antipathy and the problems that the USAF had in dealing with its own national sister services. The, uh, the Army uh, and the US Navy uh, and had much better relationships with the Royal Air Force uh, as distinct from that. So this really was a cementing sort of thing in the whole situation. But I think the Americans were looking to us at that time, <clears throat> excuse me, because we were stronger in intelligence at that moment uh, than they were themselves. That was rapidly overtaken. I have to say, by the end of the 1940s, it had flipped completely the other way. The Americans had the resources, they had the aircraft, they had the intelligence, and so on and so forth. But in that special moment we're talking about, they were very much leaning towards us for that, uh, the British, that is, for that kind of help. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that does. And um, I guess I guess there was an element of um, the RAF feeling the pain of a, of a sort of newly establishing independent force that must have yeah. really wedded them together. Um, yeah. I gathered from Harry that we've got a couple of questions in the room, so I'll turn to those next. Harry, if I can hand over to you and the audience. Okay, uh, Seb Cox, my question is for Loris and perhaps also Jean-Charles. Um, early in the... Um, in, before the war, actually, I think, or, or it might have been 1939, the, the director of plans in the Royal Air Force, then John Slesser, uh, suggested that uh, fighter command in the UK should literally try to link up with uh, the air defence system, such as it was, in northern France, so that information, for example, from chain home radars uh, on the coast uh, the east coast of Britain, covering the Channel area and and into um, the Pas de Calais, that the two systems should should literally be linked. Now that never really happened, but I did wonder whether at what stage, if at all, there was uh, an attempt to to link the post-war uh, radar chains in the UK. Um, particularly, again, on the East Coast, across to the air defence radars in northern France. Now, obviously, later, when you have a NATO system or, or a shape system, that does, to some extent, start to happen. But, but was there any attempt to do that in the immediate post-war period? Thanks. Just waiting to see if we do have Loris or jean Charles with us because I, as you will see from the chat box, um, Harry says potentially not. Uh, so we may have to wait or repeat that question if they do join us. We've only got five minutes. Um, what I will do is um, ask a question from David uh, Liaramatis, um, which is for Bill as well, 
which is an interesting one. Was the importance and global impact of the US-UK military special relationship communicated to the British public in a coordinated information pro program during this period, or was it simply pursued as a necessity without regard for UK public opinion? Which is interesting. I in the don't think there's problems with with say uh, uh, that you mentioned about Greece and Palestine and so on. I think it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that quite clearly. Um, there was a lot of uh, antipathy in Britain itself about Americans still based in Britain at the time. And I, as a young child, remember a lot of phrases on walls like go home, yank. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't as terribly nice as, as you might think. But but at the service level and, and certainly uh, throughout, I think, a lot of the government circles, there was a strong feeling to consolidate with the Americans. And this, without a doubt, was being driven by Attlee and more importantly, by his foreign minister, Ernest Bevin, who was absolutely convinced that the only way to get forward uh, in this early post-war world was to have stronger links with the Americans and disabused the Americans, or at least uh, tried to educate the Americans that socialism didn't mean communism which was always a, 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 a thing that was running through a lot of the media in the United States at that time. Getting back to the central question about the British, uh, I think there was a lot of real uh, thankfulness that the Americans were over here during the Second World War, uh, and that retained right the way through the period, but not universally. Thanks, Bill. Um, Jean-Charles, thanks for joining us. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, I, d I just want to make a quick comment before I return to the room to see to, 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 to go back to questions in the room. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that your slide uh, with the the, um, the quote from uh, Chief of the Air Staff, uh, General Jean Piolet, um, where he said, uh, where he's talking about the aviation industry in France, I thought it could have been written last week, really, because of what's been happening with COVID-19. It was equally depressing then as, as it feels now. Anyway, I'm going to hand back to the room because I know we have uh, another question in the room and, and perhaps Seb wants to come back with his question if he wants to frame it to Jean-Charles. I'll, I'll leave you to it in the room. And Jean-Charles, just a second, you're on mute, but if you, we, if you hang on a minute, we're just going to go to the room for a question. Thank you. Um, Gary Willis, um, a question for Bill Pike, please. Um, you showed, Bill, the, um, the slide of the US Air Force bases in Britain, and you mentioned that a number of them were ex expanded uh, to accommodate uh, US Air Force heavy, heavy bombers. I spoke yesterday about the agricultural cost of of retaining military airfields in Britain at the end of the war. I, I wonder, could you, could you give us a sense of what the scale of that expansion was in terms of additional acreage above and beyond the existing um, airfields? And also there was controversy, at least in some quarters, about the extent to which uh, Britain was accommodating US Air Force needs compared with France and Benelux countries. I wondered if you had any sense of of how that panned out. Um, thanks very much. Okay, well, the first thing is, I'm not aware that new airfields were being built for the benefit of the uh, USAF. Um, from what I've read and what I've seen, it was existing airfields uh, in uh, the East Anglia uh, and further north uh, that were key to the installations for the heavies the B-29s coming in, and that meant reinforced concrete because these were really heavy bombers compared to our heaviest, which was the Lancaster. Uh, so a lot of those were modified, Se several of those fields were modified. With regard to, I think the second question you asked was uh, about why we were perhaps seeing more uh, fields in, in Britain rather than in Europe, is that correct? Yes. If that, if that is the direction of the question, I think there was a lot of um, uh, convenience to having airfields in the UK. They were used to it. There was a legacy, therefore, of what was happening during the combined bomber offensive. And of course, the language position uh, and the cultural situation 
uh, gave them an easier situation to, to be on the so-called unsinkable aircraft carrier that they nicknamed us as being both in the, the Second World War and in the early Cold War. So I think there was a lot of preference to being in the UK rather than in Europe. That said, of course, there were huge bases being developed like in Wiesbaden in, in West Germany as was. Uh, so it wasn't uniquely just a British or English situation. Thank, thanks, Bill. Um, uh, Jean-Charles, just so you know, the neutral face was for your story about the internet connection, not about your paper. <laughs> my, my neutral face went in the wrong place on my message. Um, I'm just going to return to the room. I think this is going to be the final question because we're just reaching our time limit. Um, but I understand from Harry that Seb Cox has a question for you, Jean-Charles. Yeah, Jean-Charles, I don't know whether you can answer this or not, because uh, maybe Loris would have known better, but y you did mention some of the cooperation immediately post-war. In the early uh, war period, just before the war, there was a suggestion from the RAF that the, the air defence system in the UK, fighter command system, should be linked uh, to the French air defence system in the Pas de Calais, and, and operate as an integrated system. Now, that didn't happen in the war, but I wondered whether there was any attempt to do that in the immediate post-war period when the radars, et cetera, were being provided uh, under the Anglo-French agreement, whether there was any suggestion of trying to do that to link the two air defense systems, which of course did come into, did come into play later on uh, under NATO. Thanks. Uh, Jean-Charles, I think you're muted. Um, I'm just, I don't know if it's you or if it's the... Try again. No. Can I just check on the technical side? Is there anything we can do to get Jean-Charles or perhaps it's the internet connection? Okay, well... I'm really sorry about that, but it is 12.48. Jean-Charles, it's very nice to see you, even if we couldn't hear you. And we thank you very much for joining us. And, and of course, Bill uh, and Laurie for, that, for all of your papers, which have got plenty of chat going. Um, RAF Welford is, uh, is, is probably trending, I would say, on the chat more than anything. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to all of them. And um, I look forward to the rest of the afternoon. So on behalf of the RAF Museum, uh, I thank you all for your papers and I thank you, the audience, for all of your questions and comments and attention. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks, Bill. Bye, Bye Jean-Charles.